So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the star of Critical and many other great things, Lenny James. Uh, how are you? So, this show, um, I, as I said, I think it is probably the most kind of realistic and um, intense, I think is the word I would use, uh, drama I've ever seen and dealing with this kind of medical situation. Um, when you were first approached to, to star in it, what, what was your first feeling about the whole kind of concept of it, really? Well, I kind of said yes straight away just because it was Jed. Jed Mercurio, so Jed, Jed Mercurio, Mercurio who wrote it. Who wrote and, Line of Duty, yeah. which you starred the first yeah, series. Yeah, we, we first worked together on Line of Duty and we hit it off and... Um, I think at some point he had mentioned that he was going to do a medical drama, but he hadn't said anything more. So my first introduction to it was um, the scripts being sent and it being an offer. So I um, read it, but because of the nature of it, because the jargon is so strong, because um, it, uh, this, this, um, the uh, race kind of starts the minute the clock goes on, um, it's a script that I read more, I think, than any other script I've been sent just because I didn't understand it, didn't know what anybody was talking about, um, didn't make any sense, and the guy I was playing um, wasn't in the first episode, so it was odd. But um, We should say he does pop up eventually. I do pop up eventually. Um, but in that particular version, he wasn't oh, in the okay. first episode. Okay. And um, so that was my first introduction to it. But once you get into it, it the, the scripts are mesmerising. And I think um, that the final... Um, episodes that we've done, it, uh, this, it has really translated that you kind of have a, as you say, you kind of have a physical reaction to it, a kind of um, visceral reaction to it, mm. um, as much as you do, you know, whether or not you're in, in, enjoying the drama of the piece. Because mm. we should say one of the many unique things about it is it's, it's told in real time. So every week there's a case, there's a kind of extreme medical trauma case in this extraordinarily designed um, unit yes. in, in, the, in the show. And <clears throat> the story is told in the hour. Everything that happens in the hour is supposedly happening within an actual hour of, of how it would happen in real life, if that makes sense. So yes, that's a does. big challenge, both in terms of writing these episodes and I presume acting in them as well. It is. Um, because, um, firstly, if you're in a scene, you're in a scene. There's no escaping. You can't, you know, when it's on somebody else, you can't not be there. And it's the usual way that the process of us filming, particularly when we got into the operating theatre or when we were in recess and everybody is around um, uh, the, um, the patient, and it's a bit like filming a scene around a table. I don't know if you guys know about filming scenes around the table. They are notoriously um, time-consuming because you have to do everybody's point of view to everybody else who's in the room. So even if it's three people around the table, um, that's a lot more... Um, time consuming than just two people standing opposite each other. And um, so when it's in an operating theatre and people are moving in different directions and collecting different things and bringing different things, and it's incredible. We would do, we did, I think, seven days on one um, operation. And for television, that's an exceptionally long amount of time. But also, the, we would do the acting. Um, uh, so the cameras, any camera that was seeing faces, um, we would um, shoot those first, and then we would shoot the operation, which pretty much meant um, five cameras. There was always one camera rolling from above because that was also part of the set because we have monitors all around the operating theatre that is showing what we're doing, so that's running all the time. So it's six cameras on an operation, and, um, and, we, and it plays out in real time. So if it was 20... I think the longest we did was 26 minutes, but if, it, if the operation took 26 minutes, we shot for 26 minutes each take. Wow. Wow. Um, that is incredible. And it, as you said, there is a lot of jargon, medical jargon. I mean, you, you play a very experienced um, surgeon. You kind of arrive, I say, to, to, without giving everything away, to, you're not part of the team that's dealing with the first case, and then you arrive, you walk in, <laughs> very in an exciting manner, arrive on the case. Um, what, what kind of preparation did you do to play this kind of expert genius doctor? Um, England has changed its um, kind of focus on critical care. So now um, uh, trauma, they've set up 23 trauma units across the country, one of which coincidentally is the, um, m my local hospital where I grew up. So it's St George's Hospital in Tootin is now the trauma unit for South West London and out into Surrey. And um, the unit there 
um, Heather Jarman, who is the, um, the lead there, and Gary Matham, who is her deputy, they basically just opened their doors to us, really. And um, we started there as a group. There were, I think we were there for two weeks um, with the whole team, and then each individual went with their equivalent. So I went with Gary Matham, who is a vascular surgeon and is a trauma surgeon, and I spent... I think basically another two weeks and then during filming I would go and see him periodically and I sat in um, in operations mm. I uh, hung out I, I walked into other people's operations with him I think I saw an amputation I saw um, keyhole surgery I saw a lot of because he's a vascular surgeon so I saw a lot of um, uh, um, vascular surgery most of it was um, harvesting veins if you can believe such a thing and um and using those to keep gut blood flowing either to um, the extremities basically to hands and legs and saving parts of people's bodies and were you a squeamish person or did you, were you happy to watch all of this uh, extraordinarily gory stuff happy <laughs> is not necessarily the okay. phrase i would use but um i wasn't squeamish no okay no okay I found I was surprised by how how much it didn't um, freak me out, and I think part of that is is that in the operating theatre the the patient is anonymous. Right. They're covered. Only the bit that you're working on is the bit that you mostly kind of see. And I think also one of the things that's attractive about this production, I think um, actually a, a, somebody who was interviewing me um, the other day mentioned it, is the part of um, the hospital that we show you that is most um, uh, um, uh, uh, focused on in our story is a part that none of you will see. Yeah. Um, because um, if you're in that part of the theatre, you're unconscious. And if you're not unconscious, then you're in a really bad way. Yes. So um, it's an operating theatre and it's resus and it's people with critical injuries. And although... We, you know, we um, play with the premise that we set up. It's pretty much hangs out all the way through. And did you find it, um, how hard did you find it to learn all of that jargon and to kind of essentially, you know, for the purposes of this series, become that doctor? I've never done as much homework on a gig as I have this. And I've been lucky in my career to kind of um, to um, be learning new skills. You know, I did a film called Among Giants, which was about men who paint electricity pylons. So I went and learned how to paint electricity pylons because we were filming on one of them and we couldn't go up it without passing the, the um, what you needed in order to paint electricity pylons. So for about four months, I had a qualification to paint electricity pylons if the acting didn't work out. And I've learned to ride motorbikes, scuba dive, do all of those kind of things. But on this one, um, every evening there was homework. And the flat I was staying in, there were loads of bits of string hanging off of doorknobs and, and, uh, and off of um, chests of drawers where I'd be practicing my ties and all of that. And the way that you practice your sutures is on banana skin. So there would be kind of random bits of banana around my flat with bits of stitching in them. Nice. So are you now a trained surgeon, effectively? Could you? Uh, I am, you... apart from the whole knowing what I'm doing. Oh, okay. All right. Apart from that, I okay. am probably the best surgeon in the room. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> um, in terms of, I mean, obviously we should say not only do you get to see this an extraordinary case every week told in real time, but it is also about characters and it's about um, their ongoing lives and your character particularly we get to know over, you know, over the period of time. Um, were you kind of aware of how cleverly, really, the writer was weaving that in? Because, I, because I should, you know, we should make clear, you're only watching, you're watching this case and at the same time you're kind of getting to know the characters. That's a pretty tall order, isn't it, for a drama to kind yeah, of... Yeah, I mean, Jed, is, um, Jed McCurry, the writer, has set up quite a... Um, uh, restrictive yeah. um, storytelling um, That's the word I was looking for. Yeah, area to play in because yeah. you're only seeing the hour and this t group of people only come together um, when there is a critical injury. Right. The rest of the time you know, the anaesthetist is in, he's in a different department and everybody's in different departments. They only come together for this, yeah. for this hour and I tried to describe it to somebody and it's as, as if you're you're taking a train every morning into work and um, every morning when you take the train you sit in a particular seat and a particular person sits opposite you and you share your lives as you're doing it but it's only on the length of that journey going into work so whatever happened to him or her the night before um, only you only share it 
on that train journey in and um, critical is that train journey except the train journey is the golden hour the most important hour in critical um, uh, uh, care is that um, is that one hour where these people come together and the relationships they have the friendships they have the bur- the, the, the new love affairs that are going on old relationships that are being um, reinvestigated all of that happens over the one hour where you're trying to save someone's life Exactly. Um, just to give you a kind of more of an, ex- an idea of what we're going to be watching and, uh, and of the show, we have got this kind of montage. Uh, let's have a look at this. We get a little sense there that he is a fairly kind of arrogant uh, kind of guy. Is that fair? Do you think? How would you describe him? You say arrogant, <laughs> I say confident. <laughs> fair you enough. Know, it's just a different word. Yeah. Yeah, but as if I'm playing someone that kind of, you know, he seems to be very aware of his of his um, skills and of his kind of, from what I've seen, I've only seen two episodes, certain of his kind of place in the world, if you like. Um, our story's told over 13 episodes, right. so um, what you might first meet yes. isn't necessarily who he ends up being. Sure. And as you get to know him, you realise partly why he might walk into a room and be that particular guy. Okay. But also, you know, I'm not playing the the job the man does I'm playing the man mm. um, but he has a particular job and he has to play a particular role and he has to make um, uh, life and death genuinely has to make life and death decisions um, in a split second and he has to be able to be confident enough to back his decisions and that takes a certain animal he's not asking permission mm. um, it the the this the responsibility is on him and and yes he is confident in his skills but he's also confident in his skills because he's um he's an army doctor you know he's part of the um the military corps of the british army he's a lieutenant colonel and um and he, part of his confidence comes from the fact that he has practiced medicine in war zones and um and now he's bringing those skills back to the uh, nhs so if he has to do it with duct tape and a straw he will do it with duct tape and a straw because he's done it before. Right. And so he's that guy. Yeah. But um, over time, um, you learn different things about him. But, mm. um, you know, it's 13 episodes. So it's, and as I was saying before, because of the, the, um, uh, the particular structure of the story, it's, a, it's, you know, as you get to know about the medicine, as you become more informed about um, what's going on kind of um, uh, technically and clinically, it's the same way you get to know the the characters and who they are and what matters to them and who in the room matters to them and who they're trying to impress and who they're mm. trying to bed. Yes, yes. Um, what was the tone like on sex? I'm, I'm fascinated because obviously the tone of the show is, very, is incredibly intense. I mean, there is, <coughs> there is kind of dark humour in it, um, and as, well, as, particularly as we're getting to know the characters, but there's also this extraordinary, I mean, uh, there's a shot I remember in episode one where some, some, someone's stomach is being cut open, and you see that in great detail. When you're watching that being filmed, what's, what's the kind of you know tone? Is it is it there's a kind of dark humour, or you have to, have to take it very seriously? But what was it like? The first time I had to cut, I had to do a laparotomy, and um, which is to slice someone down the centre in order to get into their abdomen, and. Um, Gary Maytham, who's the, who was um, my mentor, was standing at the monitor um, watching. And I had to cut like a trauma surgeon. And they cut slightly different. This wasn't an elective surgery. It wasn't slow and neat and all of that. I had to cut fast and I had to cut deep. And, um, and if, it, if I didn't pull it off, then it would be somebody else's hands. So I didn't want it to be anybody else's hands. So it was a matter of pride, but then it also causes... Um, you to kind of be nervous and uh, when I picked up the scalpel my hand was kind of shaking and I put it back down and then I went back to Gary and I went I'm really nervous and he goes you're supposed to be nervous we're always nervous and use it for what you're doing so I went in and and got it done and um, and it became it what we the 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 kind of environment on set was um, that we were having a lot of fun and uh, but we were having a lot of fun taking it seriously mm. and people wanted to be good at their jobs people wanted to show um in the main how much they'd learned and it almost became kind of um kind of territorial you know uh, prasanna who plays the anaesthetist wanted to make sure that he was true and honest to the anaesthetist and danny who plays the odb wanted to be true to that and the you know the staff nurses and the registrars and all of the different people wanted to um, show um, uh, the training and the hours that they'd put in and fight their particular corners. Right. Um, 
Do you think this show, I mean, you know, you worked with Jed, Mc, Jed McCurio's um, Line of Duty, and I think it was one of the best kind of police dramas we've ever had on British TV, Thank certainly, you. Which, you, which you were in the first series of. Um, do you know if Jed, did he write this role for you? Obviously, you worked with him before. Was it specially tailored for you? you do you know? Have you asked him? Um, I don't know if he wrote the, the part for me. I do know that um, once it was written, he didn't want he didn't want it to be anybody else. Right, right. And what do you think is so special about his writing? Can you pin it down? Can you kind of... Um, Jed is... Uh, he's a really weird mix, Jed, is because he's an incredibly accomplished man and everything he does he does to the nth degree so he is a published author he is a producer he has um, just directed a new version of Lady Chatterley's Lover he's an award-winning writer um, he is also a trained um, medical doctor and worked in the ER for three years and um, his medical training was paid for by the RAF so he's also a fighter pilot <laughs> and um, so he doesn't do anything by half right. and he's um, meticulous in his research but he's also incredibly kind of um, open to other people's input mm. he's not a megalomaniac he's not in fact he's always kind of including himself out of situations he's always kind of going no 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 if you think that then that's re he's incredibly um, open and welcoming and um, but he does the work he always does the work he never leaves a question unanswered um, he's he loves being collaborative he wants actors to have um, uh, opinions he's not threatened by anybody he's and he's he's in a really good place at the moment and he's and it's just a, um, a joy to work with and when he's on the set it's, and he was on the set a lot because he show run um, these, these, the first season, is that um, uh, when he's on the set, it just, uh, there's just a different vibe. There's a confidence that he instills in um, everybody that he works with and a confidence that he has that isn't arrogant and isn't shutting anybody down. Mm. I, thought, um, I think this feels like, um, along with Line of Duty, Line of Duty felt like a very, very pacey, thrilling kind of, um, I would say, American-style piece of drama in, that, in the sense of the boldness and ambition and this again feels even more like a kind of huge big project yeah. is that the do you get do you agree with that do you, and do you think like tv almost this feels like an example of a bit of a golden age of tv and the tv is possibly where it's at in terms of roles for actors and kind of in-depth long-form stories being told i think for, yes i do i think it's true um uh, the golden age thing is kind of used a, a, a lot. I, I think that there is um, a lot of things have come into play to make it so that television is now what it is. Mm. Not least the fact that there are a million different ways to watch television. Um, now you know that you can. You don't have to turn on on the day that it's on and if you don't see it you're going to miss it you know, there's binge watching now there's Amazon are doing stuff and Netflix are doing stuff and everybody's doing stuff and it's international mm -hmm. you know what we're making here isn't just for the British audience you you're making stuff now with a sense that it's going to be seen across the world and um, and that's kind of what has made television golden because it's meant that people invest in it and by investing in it it means that the talent comes to it and because the talent comes to it more risks are taken and because there's so much stuff being made people are looking to tell stories in a different way mm. and critical is, a, is an example of that we're trying to push the boundary this is um this is grown-up television for people who don't want television to patronize them anymore mm. do you think would you like it to be a kind of you know if it, if it does well hopefully it does well a look kind of on running thing that you could you know this could this could be the next few years of your life are you are you prepared for that i am prepared for that <laughs> and also signed good. <laughs> so oh, good. i don't really have much choice <laughs> excellent um but also it's um yeah absolutely there's a there's a lot more story to tell and there's is a, um, and I'd like to take this character a little bit further. We should mention, um, I'm sure that a lot of the audience here are, are very aware that you're in um, a little show called The Walking Dead. Yeah, it's a well. little thing that no one watches. Yeah, and you've recently brilliantly um, come back after after a few years away, um, thank God. Everyone's very excited about it. We, I mean, you must, be, I'm always amazed, you must be amazed by how just how, that show is pretty much the biggest thing in American TV right now. Isn't yeah, it? it is, it's phenomenal. And I don't know that everybody knows it in the same way because you know american television gets huge amounts of viewers yeah. but um you know the walking dead is on a um free cable channel and um which historically they don't get huge viewing figures yeah. i mean a lot of the shows that we think of as you know big american shows like the sopranos and breaking bad and mad men and six feet under and all of those things they historically 
did not get huge mm. viewing figures. Yeah. Um, you know, I think on its best day in the last season, I might be wrong, but the Sopranos got close to two million. Yeah. Um, yeah. On their last, um, uh, on the first episode of the new uh, series on on um, uh, The Walking Dead, it got close to twenty six million people watching. Yeah. It is the only records it has left to break <laughs> are its own. Mm. Um, it's a, it's phenomenal, and um, and it takes everybody by surprise. So why, why do you think it's done so well? I've got no idea, <laughs> and, I, and also what's more important, I don't want to know. No. I don't. I don't want to. You know, if I ever walk back onto the the set of The Walking Dead, I don't want to be in a situation where I kind of go, I know what works, and so I'm just going to keep doing that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a um, it's a happy accident, and and again, I think it's a lot of people working at the top of their game and investing in their story, and um, and it reaches people, it touches people. And a lot of British acting tell, obviously Andrew Lincoln, the main main role, but uh, David Morrissey was in it as well. Yourself, was that kind of, that must be lovely that you'll get to kind of hang out with British people making <laughs> this am amazing, massive show. It's very, it's very weird. He's going to hate me for telling you this story, but um, Andrew Lincoln, when uh, Andy, when he's, um, as soon as he gets off the plane, they film in Atlanta, as soon as he gets off the plane, he's American. Uh -huh. So um, his whole time when he's talking, to anybody, whether the cameras are rolling or not rolling, whether whatever's going on, he stays in the accent all the time, to the point where um, the last time I was back, it was his birthday, when I went back to do an episode called Clear. And uh, it was his birthday, and he got a birthday present from the crew, and he said, I'm going to respond to you guys now as Andy. And he did it in an English accent, wow. and there were about five or six members of the crew standing around me went, Andy's English? <laughs> really? My God! And um, so because he was in it, and Clear was an episode where there was a lot of work just between me and Andy in a, in a room, I tried to kind of stay in the accent. So you've got two English guys <laughs> on an American film set speaking to each other in American accents. And at one point we went, out, we went outside and we were just kind of chatting, and I, he was kind of going, so you, you, you'd seen any football re recently? <laughs> and I went, yeah, no, I can't do that. <laughs> If we're going to speak about Spurs and Arsenal, we yes. have to do it in English accents. I was going to because you are a Spurs fan. I am, and yes. he's an Arsenal fan. Yeah, I'm an, I'm an Arsenal fan as well. Oh, I just want to make that clear. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. But you're doing, you're doing pretty well, so that's fine. Oh, why? Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's very patronising of me. Yes. Sorry. You don't um, want to get started. Yeah. But you live in LA, that we should say, don't you? You're based in LA. Yes. Your family's based in LA. And what is that like as a kind of British actor? You've done loads of American kind of network shows and stuff. Is, it, is, it, you, is that the kind of place you want to be is it happy are you happy there doing all that um i'm i'm there for all the reasons that you go to la which is um uh the the um the horizons the opportunities are different and um and it happened because i was doing a show there and um, the first show i did in america was called jericho mm -hmm. and we just shoot for a huge amount of time you shoot for uh, i think we shot for nine months of the year although critical is the longest um, shoot I've done because that was 10 months of the year but um, and it was a long time away from my family mm. and because I was contracted to do it um, after the first year um, we decided to base ourselves there and um, and having based myself there work has just come in that has, at the moment has just kept me there mm. so um, it's a it, I like it there I love the sea I love the weather and um, and I like my spot um, that I've got there, and um, and if I can come back and do things like critical and line of duty, then um, it feels like I've got the best of both worlds, really. And um, and for the work that I'm doing in America, I kind of need to be in America to to be able to walk into the rooms. Yeah, right. Um, do you hang out with a lot of expat British actors there? Is that what you do, or do you? Are you uh, um, yeah. It's pretty much like I am, it is here. They end up being just friends that you make through your kids, yeah, really. Right. Um, and there are a few actors that. Um, um, that I've met out there, and but I, you know, it's um, I don't want to move to America and be isolated. So I got a lot of American friends, and um, and have and on, you know, have made a concerted effort to be involved in the country that I'm living in. Do you keep in touch with British culture? Do you watch, match to watch British TV? And I do yeah. actually. When I when I first moved over there, and I had to set up the house for um, when my family moved over, I got four beds, a television, <laughs> and um, whatever service I could get so I could watch the football. Uh, and that's all I had. So they were very happy when I when they arrived. <laughs> It's yeah, okay. literally an empty house apart from four beds and a TV yeah. and a little stool that I could sit on so I could watch Spurs. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, I want to mention you've, you've, you've written in the past. I mean, you've, you wrote a great um, 
TV big TV film years ago set in um, a kind of t- about children in care, yes. which I think was very kind of. I remember being incredibly powerful. Um, and he wrote a play, which was very successful. Would you like to do more of that? And is that on your agenda? Have you got um, time to do more of that? Yes, I, I um, am actually at this particular moment in time um, uh, writing a television series. Oh, cool. Yeah, I can just you, finished the second episode. Can you say any more about it? I that? can't, no. Oh, okay. But um, but it's um, it's exciting. And I think when I went to America, because I was I had to hit the ground running and I had to um, uh, focus on that, and because I was out of the country, I didn't want to be in America writing about um, England. So I um, uh, w- the writing for a minute just took a, uh, a back seat. But um, now it, that, that has kind of changed around, and I, I kind of um, feel more settled and confident and so um, I've kind of sold an idea that I'm trying to um, uh, move to the next stage so we can get it made. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, exciting. Um, and I'm going to throw it open to the audience, by the way, so if you have any questions, um, be thinking of that in a sec. I've got one more question. Myself. Yeah, I'll come to you in a sec. My final question about critical is, as I've, I've seen two, the second episode involves a woman with a spike through her head, I should, I should mention to everyone, that's the kind of level of stuff we're dealing with. Can, is there is there a scene or a moment coming up in the, in the rest of the series that you can remember as being one of the most uh, kind of even more extraordinary or as extraordinary as that that we can look forward to? Yeah, there is. There's an um, there is an episode where we have to um, lift out a lady's uterus um, as far as it will go, and she is 22 weeks pregnant. And um, I need to get behind her uterus in order to um, uh, remove something that is um, causing her distress. And everybody in the room um, wants to save... Protocol is you save the mother, not the baby. And I want to save them both. And um, so I'm arguing with people across the room. But also, I love the scene because there are personal stuff going going on across the room and it's the moment when it reaches its kind of zenith in a, oh, wow. in a way and it all happens within a situation with the people who are making the decisions and are arguing about the decisions are, um, are arguing about the, the clinical aspect of it but they're also arguing about the emotional aspect of it and um, there are th- three hands, three sets of hands in this lady's um, um, belly and um, the climax of it really is about the ticking clock and to the extent that one of the people in the room is counting down, is literally mm. going, you, you've got 10, 9, and I've got to get in there and do what I've got to do within the time that this, this guy is counting down. And it was, it was lovely to play, and I've seen the scene, and it works really well. Oh, fantastic. What episode is that in? You know? I think it's episode 7, but I okay. won't be wrong. Cool. That's something to look forward to. Five. Six. It's episode five. Episode five. There we go. Episode five. So, yeah, let's throw it over to the audience. The guy in the middle. We've got microphones so we can all hear you. Uh, and the first guy was right in the middle there just to test the microphone. Oh, there we go. That's one night's way. Thanks for being here today, first of all. Um, when you started off as a, when you started off acting, was there ever a moment when you said to yourself, hey, I'm pretty good at this. I could probably make a living doing this. And if so, what was that moment? Uh, I don't think that moment's arrived yet, but um, there was, a, there was, I went to an all boys school, um, which there, um, there was no unifying thing in my, in my school apart from sport. And you were kind of defined in my school by the fact that you had made the team. And it didn't matter. We played loads of sports. I mean, you, I don't think there was a sport you can name that we didn't play at school or didn't have a team. So everybody had an opportunity to make the team. And after I did my first play, um, what, the director of the play um, stopped me one evening after a performance half, halfway across the road and um, said, are you going to do this again? And I said, I'm not sure. And um, she said, I think you should. I think you can. And it was like she was saying, you're good enough to be on the team. So, um, well, that's how I took it, really. And that's why I did a second play and then just carried on doing it. Thank you. With regards to your acting career, um, have you ever found you've had moments where, I mean, perhaps when you were first starting out, where you thought to yourself, should I carry on, should I not? Because you're not going to get acting roles all the time. And sometimes you play mental games with yourself, thinking, is this the right decision that I've done? How have you kept yourself going in the sense of from where you were once were to where you are now? Um, I've been very lucky, I have to say, and I've kind of worked continuously or there's been the possibility of of work. And um, so uh, it's I can't 
in all honesty, talk about the sense of, I'm not, I'm not, the longest period of unemployment I had was um, kind of, I, I think, five months when, uh, and that was quite recently when I first moved to America. And um, so I'm uh, very aware of how lucky I am in a business where at any one point, 96% of the people who do what I do are unemployed. Um, so uh, I, I am aware of my luck and and the effort I put into it but it was and it was partly why I started writing because I, of my fear of unemployment and um, and if somebody else wasn't if I wasn't gonna um, the one of the pe best pieces of advice I got when I first started acting was uh, an older actor who said to me make sure you can do something else and um, and um, and that's um, what I decided to do I love the the business of telling stories so um, I figured if I if I could write, um, or I could try to write, um, then that was I could do it another way. Uh, but I was always expecting someone to tap me on the shoulder and go, "Mate, time's up, move aside." But um, so far, I've kind of kept ahead of the Scooby Doo hand. Thank you. And final question from the front row. Can you tell us something about you that no one knows? Oh. Good one. Um, I can do the Rubik's Cube in under a minute. Wow. Have you got one on you? Can you no? I'm not going to prove that. Oh, point. damn. Okay. Um, yeah, I can do the Rubik's Cube. That's amazing. Oh, Self-taught. A great, great last question. That must be helped with the surgery in uh, Critical, maybe. I don't know. It shows you um, how dexterous you are. With yes. Your, yeah. yeah. Didn't hurt. Okay. Um, so you've got about an hour and 50 minutes to rush home. Uh, oh no, or even two hours and 50 minutes. Nine o'clock, Sky One, Critical Starts tonight. Um, everyone should watch it. It is absolutely fantastic. Extraordinary series. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to your great questions. And thanks to Lenny James. Thank you.